Good morning. Thank you for joining us today for our Farm Foundation Forum, Green Energy Pitfalls and Payouts on the Farm. We're glad to have the opportunity to engage with you today and are thankful to Farm Credit for their support of this forum. My name is Sherry Rogi Fiddler and I'm the President and CEO of Farm Foundation, located just outside of Chicago, Illinois. I'm looking forward to today's discussion on renewable energy considerations on the farm. It's certainly a topic often at the top of national news, but especially in the context of agriculture, is nuanced, complex, and deserving of an in-depth conversation. We've lined up an excellent panel today to dig into that complexity. Before we get into today's program, I'd like to just take a few minutes to share a bit more about Farm Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit working at the intersection of agriculture and society to address challenges that affect the entire food and ag value chain. Specifically, we are an accelerator of practical solutions for agriculture, accelerating people and ideas into action. The three levers we use to accomplish this are policy, innovation, and education. Forums such as today's are just one part of our extensive program of work which is guided by our mission to build trust and understanding at the intersection of agriculture and society, and our vision to build a future for farmers, our communities, and our world. We rely on partnerships to fund our work and increase our impact. So if you're interested in learning more about funding or partnering with us, I invite you to reach out to explore collaboration. Now I'd like to take a minute to highlight our Friends of Farm Foundation program. With your enrollment as a friend, you will not only be helping to support the mission and vision of Farm Foundation, but you will also gain exclusive benefits such as first reads on issue papers, curated content, networking opportunities, and much more. Being a friend is an investment in building a better future for farmers, our communities, and our world. To learn more about being a friend of Farm Foundation, just check the link that is provided in the chat function of this webinar. I'd also like to encourage you to learn more about Farm Foundation and our work by visiting our website at farmfoundation.org or connecting with us on our social media platforms. If you're posting on social media about this morning's session, we ask that you please use hashtag Farm Foundation Forum. And as we get underway with today's forum, I would just like to quickly go over just a couple of housekeeping notes. There will be an audience question and answer session at the end and we'll be using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, not the chat function to queue up the questions. This forum is being recorded and will be posted on our website at farmfoundation.org, as well as our YouTube channel. And we'll send out that link following today's program. When the forum concludes, you'll receive a link to a short survey. Farm Foundation really appreciates your feedback and the time in completing that survey. So now let's turn to today's forum topic. We have an outstanding panel of experts who will discuss topics such as issues that farmers and investors face regarding green energy opportunities on the farm, including where there might be strategies for diversification and where farmers might need to be a little more cautious. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator. We're so delighted to have Tyne Morgan with us today, um, the host and executive producer of US Farm Report at Farm Journal Media. From Missouri, Tyne's family has been farming for generations. She started broadcasting on the radio when she was just 16 years old and got her degree in agriculture journalism uh, sometime thereafter. She was a reporter and news anchor for 10 years for Ag Day Television and Agritalk Radio before becoming the host of U.S. Farm Report in 2014, the first woman in that position. So we're so delighted to have you with us today, Tyne, and at this time, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you very much to the Farm Foundation uh, for asking me to host this event. Uh, you know, covering Ag News every week on U.S. Farm Report, we dive into a wide range of topics. But over the past year, definitely there's been an emphasis looking um, at green energy, climate smart farming practices, and really what it means to farmers, or ranchers, and landowners in general. And so I'm really excited for this topic today because, you know, as you look at some of the opportunities uh, that, you know, landowners and farmers and ranchers uh, are, are prepared for and really exploring right now, you know, when you look at USDA, we saw a $1 billion investment for or announcement for climate smart farming practices. Um, we heard from the White House recently about deploying clean energy and really focusing on rural areas. 
And then recently we had a near record at the time it was a record land sale in Iowa. And what drove that record sale was the fact that it had a wind turbine and the investors that came in to purchase that land saw that revenue uh, as an opportunity. And so, you know, when you look at this, it really does impact now more than just agriculture, but it's at a time when, uh, you know, farmers are really trying to navigate what's new, uh, what's the same, and really what are some things that you need to be, be watching and navigating the complexity of green energy pitfalls and payouts on the farm is exactly what we're doing today. And in order to do that, um, you, we mentioned we have a great panel, Shannon Farrell of Oklahoma State University, Howard Halderman, president and CEO of Halderman Farm Management, as well as Garrett Talget, he's with Illinois Farm Bureau. And so we, we will navigate a lot of different angles of this topic today, but to kick it off, I wanna hand it over now to Shannon Farrell to continue the conversation. Shannon is an associate professor in the Oklahoma State University Department of Agriculture Economics, and he actually specializes in agricultural law grew up on a cattle and wheat operation in Western Oklahoma. And then he obtained his bachelor's and master degrees in agricultural economics from OSU before obtaining uh, his Juris Doctorate from the Oklahoma City University School of Law. Shannon spent a number of years in private practice and he focused on agriculture and as well as environmental, energy and corporate law before joining OSU in the summer of 2007. So Shannon, I'll hand it over to you. All right, time. Thank you so much. Greetings, everybody, from a pretty uh, icy Oklahoma. So I will apologize if my signal breaks up a little bit. I am broadcasting to you live from my basement because I can't make it to my office. And if the signal gets spotty, well, we'll have a separate Farm Foundation webinar about rural broadband access because I know that's an issue for everybody. Um, I'm really excited to address you all about this today. I grew up with wind energy because I grew up in western Oklahoma. And I grew up at a 10 degree angle because you're always leaning into the wind. We had to use wind to pump water for our cattle. And so wind energy was kind of just part of my life growing up. But growing up on a sunny Western Oklahoma farm, you know, solar power was always something that fascinated me as a kid. That was the stuff of, of NASA and spacecraft. And now it's something that, you know, a ton of us have on our roofs, powering us as part of everyday life. So I really want to come to you from my perspective today, working in the Ag Econ Department at Oklahoma State University. I get tons of questions every day from farmers and ranchers who are being approached by developers to build a solar project, build a wind project, and they simply just want to know, is this good for my farm? How's it going to impact my land use? How's it going to impact my bottom line? Is, is it good for my community and for my state? And so what I want to do to kind of set everybody else up that's going to follow today is just kind of give you a very brief flyover of the technologies that are involved, talk a little bit about some of the land uses, but then my, my fellow panelists are going to dive a lot deeper into some of the contract issues and to do some of the land use issues. And then at the end, when we have our question and answers, we can kind of pull those things together. So let's take a look at our next slide. And I want to kind of emphasize something. I'm not just a nerd. Yes, I, I am totally a nerd. But the reason that I want to talk to you guys about how solar panels work and about how wind turbines work is that you need to understand the fundamentals of the industry so that you understand what a developer wants to get out of a project in terms of technical and financial success. And to do that, I think farmers and ranchers are actually very well positioned because they're in the land use business. And for many of us, for centuries or even at least decades, we've been you know, co locating our agricultural operations with oil and gas. And some of the lessons that you can learn from co locating oil and gas and agriculture can be applied to wind and solar. But you have to understand that there are also some really important differences. If you can bring that experience and couple that with a good understanding of the technical fields, then you're really well positioned to make some good land use decisions. So really quickly, when we're talking about solar photovoltaic, and by the way, there are other solar technologies out there. There's concentrating solar thermal, where we have a large array of mirrors reflecting sunlight back to a central collection tower to collect heat. You know, that's popular, uh, sorry, popular in the desert southwest of the United States and other parts of the world. But for the most part, when we talk about a solar project, we're talking about photovoltaic, which is a fancy word, which simply means we're directly converting the sun's energy into electrical energy by making photons move electrons around inside a panel. And so this little animation that you see before you right now is simply how that happens. Solar is amazing because there are no moving parts involved. Maintenance issues for solar projects are, are much less than they are for wind energy projects, as we'll talk about here in a second. But again, no moving parts. It's all solid state technology. So things are pretty straightforward. If we take a look at the next slide, you'll see how a large collection of solar modules 
get connected together into strings. That's part of, you know, not only collecting the energy, but also managing the voltage, because then we have to take that higher voltage energy and use an inverter to convert what is DC power coming out of the solar panels into AC power and synchronizing that to the grid. So that's usable for homes and businesses. And so one solar panel is not going to cut it. We need to have a pretty large array. And uh, larger arrays are what we're seeing more and more. You know, we started out seeing lots of 10, 15, 20 acre projects. And now we're seeing projects into the thousands of acres. And we'll talk about the different land use aspects of solar versus wind here in a moment as well. But if we take a look at the next slide, what we see here is how we're working with wind power. So with wind power, it's very different from solar. We're taking the kinetic energy of the wind and using it to drive what is essentially a windmill. Lots of you may have windmills that you use to pump water for your cattle or, or other livestock on your farm. Well, what we're doing here is simply taking that kinetic energy, capturing it with the blade. And by the way, these blades are basically airplane wings. So you're not actually pushing the turbine along, you're actually pulling the turbine along using a lift concept, the Bernoulli principle there. That's then turning a drive shaft, which is connected to a gearbox. Your rotor is probably only turning about 10 to 20 RPMs, but through a transmission system, we're probably turning a generator at several thousand RPMs to generate the level of energy and the, and the frequency of energy that we need again to convert to AC to send out to the grid that way. So that's kind of the basic technologies. When we're talking about solar, obviously you need a bright place that's not shaded so we have unrestricted access to the sun. If we're talking about a wind turbine, we're talking about a place where we need to have large wind swept areas and we don't have anything obstructing the wind or causing turbulence there. So let's look at the next slide and look at some resource maps. And the next maps I'm gonna show you are solar resource. When we talk about DNI, that's the level of energy that a solar panel is gonna have access to if it's pointed directly at the sun. I think you guys are all pretty familiar with astronomy enough to know that the sun moves across the sky during the day. So for us to really access this amount of energy, you have to have a tracking solar panel mount that has to constantly move the panels that's always directly facing the sun. Well, that adds mechanical components, that adds complexity, and, and that adds expense and also and maintenance issues. So really, where we predominantly see tracking systems are in the desert southwest because that's where you really get the most bang for the buck from those systems. And again, that's also where you see those concentrating solar thermal projects. If you take a look at the next slide, this is what we call GHI, and I won't get too technical with you. Just think about it this way. GHI measures how much energy a solar panel would be able to capture if it were laying flat on the ground. So no tilt, no anything. It's just getting whatever incidental sunlight the sun gets, or sorry, the, the earth gets. And if you notice this map, it's a lot more democratic. You know, the previous map showed you that things were very concentrated in the desert southwest, southwest, a lot broader area having access to some pretty decent solar resources here in the US. And if you look at the next slide, which depicts our solar project maps, you know, there are some surprises and some give me's here, right? You um, see lots of projects concentrated here in the desert Southwest, California, Arizona, uh, many in Texas and New Mexico. But I want you to notice something else. Go out and look at the Eastern seaboard, a tremendous amount of concentration there and really, a lot of that is driven by smaller projects, a lot of rooftop projects that are actually using distributed generation concepts that we're using people's roofs as the solar arrays versus large open spaces there. So on our next slide, we'll take a look at the wind resource map. And I am proud to say here in Oklahoma where the wind comes sweeping down the plains, we're part of this big belt of very high wind resource in the Great Plains region. And it's windy here because there's nothing to stop the wind, right? We're actually a relatively flat topography, not a lot of trees or hills. And so that actually allows wind speeds to get up quite a bit and stay fairly stable. Um, so wind is kind of where you would expect it would be, not so much out to the coast on either side and really not as much in the mountains, unless you're looking at the peak of the mountains there in the Rockies. It really is you know, largely here in, in the central Great Plains. And I will point out too that it's been fascinating to watch. You know, we keep seeing ever growing increases in the proportion of our electrical generation here in the Southwest Power Pool, which is kind of what takes up a large chunk of the Great Plains being attributed to wind power. Um, during the most recent winter storm before this one, um, there were a couple of days where the proportion of power being generated in the Southwest Power Pool was over 40% and on one day, 
generated by wind when we really needed that, that extra power because a lot of people were having their heaters kick on. So wind is kind of where you expect it to be. And if you look at the next slide there, you'll see a map of the wind energy projects in the United States, which you see largely follows that. Again, some distribution as you get towards the seaboards there as well, but really the largest concentration of wind power that you see is in the Great Plains. Uh, Texas is the runaway number one uh, project uh, in the state with, sorry, the United States with over, I think, 32 gigawatts of power from wind. Iowa is second with, uh, I believe, about 10,000, and then Oklahoma's right behind Iowa with about 9,000, uh, sorry, 9,000 megawatts or 9 watts of power installed there as well. What's driving all this? Is it, you know, an incredible carbon consciousness on the part of national and state policymakers, or is it the market? Well, if you take a look at the next slide, I'm here to tell you it's largely being driven by the market because over the past decade, you've seen the costs of equipment for both solar wind go down hard. We had tremendous gains in how cost effective wind and solar can be um, just in an open marketplace. And that's really driven a ton of it. You know, I'll say in my own state of Oklahoma, we have a very significant portion of our electrical generation portfolio driven by natural gas. And natural gas is a natural complement to both wind and solar because it can ramp up and down very quickly. So if you don't have the solar or the wind resource available, natural ga gas can come and compensate. And so our portfolio was just basically set up for that. And lots of other states have found that it's really just cost competitive as well, as we can illustrate on the next side, where we show the levelized cost of electricity for these various technologies. That's the LCOE. And by the way, the figures that I'm showing you take tax credits out of consideration. So this is with no federal or state tax credits. This is simply over the lifespan of a project, what it costs per megawatt hour to generate power from these technologies. And look at the top three right there. Solar has dropped so much in cost over the past decade that it's now the cost leader. Onshore wind is right behind it, beating out combined cycle natural gas. So if you're gonna build a new power project, from a cost standpoint, it's just more cost effective to use wind, solar, or natural gas. Um, and if you actually look at the next slide, you see that really bears it out because look at what we're building in terms of new electrical generation. Overwhelmingly, it's wind, utility photovoltaic, and distributed generation photovoltaic, followed you know, in a pretty distant second by natural gas and then other technologies there. But before we move on, I wanna show you one more thing there too, and that is that yellow bar that is battery storage. Battery costs have come down tremendously over the past decade as well. And in the next four to five years, it's made by industry sources that we're going to cross the threshold of $100 per kilowatt hour of battery storage. And that's important for a couple of things. Number one, it's going to make utility scale battery storage very cost effective. And you're going to have battery storage coupled with wind and solar to move wind and solar from being what we call intermittent sources to being what we call dispatchable sources, meaning it doesn't matter when the wind's blowing or the sun's shining, we can store it if we've got an excess. And if we need to dispatch that power when we've got greater demand, we can do that. And that will be an absolute game changer on the utility side, because when you couple that with the cost advances for both wind and solar and then batteries, that's gonna make wind and solar power even more cost competitive and I think you're going to see an explosion of project development on that side. At the same time, that threshold that we talked about is also a critical inflection point for the auto industry, because at that point, you can make an electric car with very good range cheaper than you can make an internal combustion car. And when you cross that tipping point, you're going to see a lot more demand for electrical uh, power from the transportation industry, which is going to drive more need for electrical generation on the utility side and things are just gonna kind of snowball at that point. So let's think like a developer and go to the next slide for a second. And if you're a developer, what you're, I'm sorry, I, I jumped ahead of slide, I apologize. I just wanna show you energy storage real quickly. Again, California, a huge leader in this because California's grid is just overworked hard. Um, Texas, by the way, I think is gonna come on big on this because Texas has had some real pain points over the past year with the ERCOT grid. So I think you're gonna see Texas actually grow when we look at this chart next year, but there's a lot of growth in that. Now let's move to our next slide and talk about the developer's mindset. If you're a developer, you're trying to balance two things. You know, Obviously you wanna be somewhere where it's sunny if you're in solar or somewhere it's consistently windy 
if it's wind. And that's a big chunk of it. But at the same time, you're looking at what does it cost to build this project? Is this site constructible? Um, how much do I have to pay for my equipment? Those are the project costs. And what you're trying to do, right, is you're trying to optimize profitability. So if I have, you know, relatively low building costs, but my trade-off is I'm doing that in a relatively, you know, moderate resource area, in the long run, it still might pay off if I've got very big project revenues because the price of electricity in that region is pretty high. But I could have a phenomenal resource um, with low build-out costs, but if it's a really, you know, cheap electrical region, I may still have a harder time being profitable. So what I want you to think about if you're a landowner is how desirable is your property? And the good news about wind and solar is we've got tons of publicly available resources to let you figure out, do I have a good solar resource? Do I have a good wind resource, right? You don't have that necessarily in the oil and gas industry, but you do have that with solar These and wind. These resources are publicly available to you. I want you to look at that, but I also want you to look at where are their large scale electrical lines? I'm not talking about the distribution lines that go to your house. I'm talking about large scale utility transmission lines that can carry that power to market. How close are you to a major load center? Load just simply means demand, which can be driven by population or by a large industrial user. So I want you to balance all that when you're trying to figure out what's your bargaining position and how well positioned are you to actually be an attractive project for others. Well, let's go to our next slide. And I want to talk briefly about some land use issues that we're going to face in agriculture. And I know that the other, um, the other panelists are going to talk about these in a lot more detail. But when you are approached by a developer, I want you to ask fundamentally five questions. And all these questions have a lot of subparts. But I want you to ask yourself, number one, how is my property use going to be impacted? Number two, how long is my property going to be impacted? How long is this agreement going to last? And, and take into account things like extension and renewals as well. What are my obligations as a landowner? What do I have to do to stay out of the way of the developer? What do I have to pay in terms of additional property taxes or anything like that? Then, of course, I want you to ask, how am I going to be compensated? And we'll talk about that in the discussion later on. But also, I want you to ask, when the project's all said and done, what assurances do I have, whether they're statutory or part of my contractual obligation with the developer, that the project gets cleaned up, that the equipment goes away, and that my land is restored to as close as possible, which we used to look like before the project came on. So let's talk about some specific land use examples here with the next slide. And I'm gonna do my best to compare and contrast wind and solar. And wind and solar are drastically different in terms of the intensity of land use. And what I mean by that is how much of their project footprint do they actually physically occupy? This is a quarter section of land that you see here shaded in the yellow. And this is actually densest wind energy parcel that we've got in the state of Oklahoma. This is the quarter section in the state that has four wind turbines on it. But if we go to the next slide, you'll see out of that 160 acres that really only about four acres are taken out of use by roads, which by the way, account for in Oklahoma approximately 75 to 80 percent of the land use for any wind project being just tied up in roads and the rest of it are the turbine pads and maintenance areas. So here we're really only using about two and a half percent of this total section. The rest of it is available for grazing, cropping, etc. So let's go to our next slide and take a look at a solar project. This one's for Maryland. This field area is about 15 and a half acres. But if you go to the next slide, you'll see that nearly half of it, you know, 43.92% of this land is being taken up by the arrays themselves. And here's an interesting thing, by the way, the higher north you go in latitude, the more your solar arrays have to be spread out to avoid shading impacts. The further south you go, the closer your arrays can be and still avoid those shading issues. So either case, you see that you're occupying a lot more land with solar relative to the total footprint than you are with wind. Wind is actually fairly dispersed. Solar is pretty compact. So that's been a real discussion for us in the renewable energy industry. How does agriculture coexist with wind? How does agriculture coexist with solar? If you go to the next slide, you see an example of what we've seen is probably one of the most successful co-located co uses in agriculture, and that's grazing of small ruminants. Um, goats and sheep have you know, shown in some early trial projects to coexist fairly well with uh, with solar arrays, they can graze in those sort of interstitial spaces between the panels there and do okay with it. But it takes a lot sometimes to persuade a developer to allow that because they want complete 
absolute control over the area. They don't want anything that could potentially interfere with their operations. And they sure don't want anything chewing through the wires because that's bad for both the animal and the array, obviously. If you go to the next slide, this is probably the best example I can show you of co-location of animal uh, large ruminant grazing and wind. In Oklahoma, we have a concept called the cow sundial that coexists with turbines. It gets hot here in Oklahoma and cows love the shade. So the cows will literally march around the turbine shade as the day goes on. And so they actually kind of like it. Um, we've noticed no real negative impacts uh, to livestock grazing from um, wind energy development in the state of Oklahoma. We haven't had any incidents of stray voltage or anything thing like that. The developers are usually very careful to make sure that all of the electrical equipment is not accessible by any animal on the surface or trying to, to dig down into it. So we've had no incidents with that. Cattle seem to get along with it pretty well. And if we go to the next slide, we can also talk about wildlife impacts. And again, in Oklahoma, we haven't really seen any appreciable wind impacts to uh, wildlife. Um, we don't really have enough solar experience to provide you with a good sampling of that. Um, I, I will tell you that, you know, we talk a lot about bird impacts and wind, and those are usually stories that come from the very early days of the industry. Nowadays, industry does do a very good job citing study to make sure that they don't put turbines in a place where they'll cause excess bird mortality. And I'll tell you, in one study, they actually found that 1,000 times more birds were killed by domestic cats than were by turbines. And this was actually a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Survey study, so they really didn't have a, a dog in the hunt there, so to speak. Um, so the wildlife impacts actually seem to be fairly minimal if the project is well designed and well executed. Let's go talk about some agricultural land use on the next slide really quickly. And we've talked about animal and livestock. Let's talk about crop. This is actually a field that's plowing around an anemometer or a MET tower. Uh, and as you can see, this farmer is trying to get the uh, absolute bang for their buck that they can to farm all the way around all the guy wires that you can't even see in the picture there. So obviously having a solar array or a wind turbine in a field is gonna cause issues to your field geometry. And that's one of the things you have to analyze in the economics. You know, With a solar project, you're talking about a near total occupation of that field. And so you may have to say, I have to write off all of the agricultural revenue I was getting from that. So that revenue has to be compensated and more and then some from the revenues I'm going to receive in the payments. With wind, it's a lot more complicated because we have to look at loss production versus gains. And I, I will tell you, in Oklahoma and most of our dry land cropping systems, and especially in our pasture systems, when you do the economic analysis, it's still a slam dunk that you're going to make more from the revenues received from the wind turbine than you're losing in lost agricultural production. But if we go to the next slide, I can show you a true win-win in the agricultural context, and that is the corner of irrigated pivots. If we can get wind turbines into those pivots, those pivots usually have far lower economic returns than we've got from the actual irrigated portion. And so it's awesome, I think, for both developer and landowner from a land use perspective and an economic perspective if you can ac occupy those uh, corners with a turbine there. As we move on to the next, we'll talk very briefly about what we are seeing as an emerging field called agrovoltaics, which is simply how can we modify the construction of solar projects to allow for, for more agricultural land use? And it's a pretty complicated solution. You go up, you just build your arrays on taller risers to allow them to access the full array of sun without any shading problems, but you also get more sun reaching to the ground and the cover level to actually get more agricultural productivity, whether it's for grazing or for cropping, or as you see here, even in greenhouse use. And if we go to the next slide, you can see an example that's being uh, conducted in a project in, uh, in Europe where we're seeing vineyard and viticulture work taking place under solar projects as well. So on the next slide, you see an example, this is from the Agrovoltaics uh, Conference that was held a couple of years ago, just to show what the co-locations can look like if you've got a developer that's willing to put the additional cost into the structure of raising the panels up a little bit to allow for more agricultural use there on the ground surface. So I mean, I'm really excited, I think, for the opportunity for renewables and agriculture to coexist. I think we're really seeing a point in the technology costs and design where we can really have profitable co-location of both agriculture and renewables. And we're going to see more demand for it because I think if you look at the forecast issues that we talked about earlier in this presentation, we're going to see more demand for renewables. It's just going to happen. And the place where renewables build is 
on agricultural land. So we really owe it to ourselves to educate ourselves on these issues, position ourselves as best we can for us to come up with win-win solutions for both our landowners and for the energy industry. And with that, I know I've exhausted my time, but I'm really excited for the discussion that's gonna follow. And I'll turn it back to time for our next presenter. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Shannon. I like the energy. So thank you for setting us off with that, with that tone. A lot of interesting things to really digest there. And that is just the start of it. Uh, a couple of reminders. Um, one, if you're just now joining us or, or just a little bit late, um, the hashtag to use, if you're on social media, you can use hashtag Farm Foundation Forum. Again, that's hashtag Farm Foundation Forum. Go ahead and use that. And then questions, I know I saw one come in. We're going to save the questions until the end, so keep those coming. And if you do have a question that pops up and you don't want to forget it, go ahead and plug that in. You could do that using the Q&A feature in the bottom right to ask those. Again, we're going to save those until we finish with all of our, our opening remarks, but go ahead and plug those in and we'll get those in the queue. All right, again, thank you, Shannon. Our next speaker is Garrett. Talget, an attorney with the Illinois Farm Bureau, Garrett was raised in Southeast Idaho, where he gained firsthand ag experience working on potato, wheat, and alfalfa farms, so diversity there. He graduated from Bingham Young University with a Bachelor of Science degree in agronomy with an emphasis in crop and soil science and attended Drake University Law School, where there he earned his Juris Doctorate along with a certificate in agricultural law. Now, most of Garrett's work in agricultural and food law is really focused on producing production uh, agriculture issues. Garrett's a frequent speaker on topics related to agriculture and energy production, including wind and solar leasing issues. So to help us navigate that, Garrett, I'll turn it over to you. There we go. That's better. Thanks, Tyne. I uh, appreciate it. It's good to be here with you all. Um, like Shannon said, I think he teed up all of the issues really well. I'm going to to a, to a talk more sort of specific, uh, specifically about some of the legal issues that we see, uh, particularly here in Illinois. Um, I'm obviously an attorney with Illinois Farm Bureau. Uh, that gives me some sort of interesting uh, perspectives on things. I think, first of all, one thing that's important to recognize is that one, I don't represent any individual landowners and, and that's kind of a blessing and a curse. On the one hand, I can always share uh, any knowledge or my perspectives that I glean with anyone who asks really because I'm not, I'm not competing for any billable hours, right? Like, a, like an, an attorney in um, uh, private practice. Um, and then two, I guess one of the downfalls of that is that you know, a lot of the things that I see in here um, are just that. They're sort of anecdotes that I'm hearing from other attorneys that are uh, sort of putting their, their boots on the ground. So with that, let's kind of start off. We can flip to the next slide and I can, uh, again, kind of give you my, my, my perspective as it relates to the to the to the legal, um, I guess. Well, really, honestly, as a lawyer, I get paid, and this is why lawyers are downers and why people don't like to hang out with lawyers, right? Um, I get paid to sort of look at risks and to try to help manage risks. You know, so lawyers, like I said, are always downers because it's always like, oh, hey, we have this great idea. Oh, well, did you think about these twenty-five things that you know could possibly go wrong? And that's kind of, I think, where I sort of come from. So on the title of this. Of this presentation, I'm I'm probably when I'm speaking to landowners and to Farm Bureau members here in Illinois, focused more on the on the pitfalls uh, because uh, because the opportunities are obvious, right? It's cash, it's money, it's a uh, it's a uh, cash leases that sometimes the numbers can be pretty high. So with that, let's uh, let's get to it. Um, this is a map showing solar farms that are in Illinois that are I would say relatively close to actually either starting construction or are under construction or are maybe even um, possibly there might be a few of these that are actually uh, up and running. Um, and I will talk later about where I get this data from, uh, but it's basically, uh, it comes from a list of agreements that every solar developer must sign with the Illinois Department of Agriculture before they construct a solar farm. So I took all of those signed agreements that have been signed so far and I made this map. Um, you'll actually see that there, uh, and those dots are all just based on the, on the GPS coordinates of the, of the projects. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, I think it's important for landowners especially to sort of understand what their role is. 
uh, I sort of see solar development as kind of like a three-legged stool, um, particularly as it pertains to responsibilities and making sure that everything is done properly. Uh, there's obviously uh, one of the legs is the landowner and making sure that their lease provisions are, are, uh, are good and are sufficient to protect them from uh, possible downsides of solar development. Um, if you look at the second one, there is uh, uh, there's the role of the county as it pertains to zoning. Obviously, some counties are 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 going to have zoning. If you look at a map of Illinois, probably the bottom half to third of the state, very few of those counties actually have zoning. So, in terms of the county's role there, it might be limited. And then the states. Uh, many states are trying to pass some sort of laws to help, kind of, I guess, set some set some guidelines for how solar development and wind development too ought to take place. Um, I say solar a lot. In Illinois, that has been uh, the biggest issue lately and the biggest sort of, uh, the biggest driver. Uh, wind development in Illinois is actually fairly mature. Uh, in fact, in the last couple of years, we have had our first wind farm actually be decommissioned, where they decommissioned a whole bunch of the towers that were somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 15 years old, they decommissioned them and then put up many fewer actually larger, more efficient towers. So wind in this state is actually quite mature. Uh, we do hear about more wind farms that are being proposed, but not nearly on the scale of, uh, of a solar. And so we'll talk about how some of the state, some of the state um, provisions go along with that. Um, when it comes to lease provisions, first of all, uh, we see, especially with solar, something that'll say in some sort of legalese, thou shalt not block the sun. Uh, and you might be thinking, well, of course, uh, how could I even block the sun if I wanted to, um, at least on like a large scale basis, right? Um, and uh, we've actually had some questions and some issues come up about normal farming practices. So if I've got a solar developer that wants to lease uh, 50 acres of a 100 acre parcel that I own, presumably I'm still going to farm the other 50 acres. Well, if I'm if I'm farming the other 50 acres that's that's adjacent to the 50 that's covered with solar panels now, if that's sort of creating a whole bunch of dust, um, and many times I'll see lease agreements that say thou shalt not create dust, again, in some sort of legal jargon, thou shalt not create dust. Well, what happens then if I'm farming corn or soybeans on half of the hundred on this other 50 over here, and the wind blows the dust on the panels, it, 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 it automatically reduces their efficiency. Are there any issues to that? Um, and I've asked solar developers that in the past, and I've received various answers, and some of them have just sort of been, oh, no, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about more like, you know, if you were to, say, develop um, a gravel pit on your adjacent acreage. We don't want that. And I'd say, oh, okay, so clearly then you'll sort of amend your stock lease to sort of say, um, well, thou shalt not create dust, but normal farming operations are exempted from that, right? Clearly you'll do that. And they'll say, well, no, we don't want to do that, um, which really goes to uh, another issue of making sure that all of your lease agreements are actually there in writing in the document versus um, relying on some oral representations. That's just good legal practice all the time, right? Um, also, frequently you'll see easements, easements for interference. Uh, basically, the developer is saying, we're going to lease your property for a certain amount of time, and then also you're going to give us an easement to do some things that you might consider to be annoying. Uh, for wind, that might be flicker. It might be some electromagnetic interference. Uh, for solar, it might be glare. It might be some noise with wind. Uh, it might also be some noise with solar. Uh, there have been some complaints about solar noise. Um, I personally... Uh, the times where I where I have toured solar farms, I have not found them uh, to be noisy, but uh, we're hearing about, you know, some people complaining about solar noise. Um, and like I say, essentially the easements that I have seen allow the developer to do some things that could be annoying. And so you as the landowner ought to figure out, okay, um, are these things they are talking about doing that I might find to be annoying? Are those deal breakers or are they not? So if we want to go to the next slide, let's talk about the, uh, the, uh, the uh, term of the agreement. Most of these that I have seen are structured in sort of, if you want to call it a lease option on the front end, uh, that can be anywhere from between six months to eight years. That basically gives the developer of the wind farm or the solar farm a chance to basically 
get other acreage under contract that they need to, to do testing, uh, you know, with uh, Met Towers, like Shannon had a photo of earlier, um, maybe some sampling to make sure that it's geologically uh, sound to build a wind tower or a solar farm on the property, and then to get the necessary permits and, and other things that they might need. I generally tell landowners in the educational meetings that I do that the shorter the diligence period, that sort of option term on the front end, the better it is for you, right? Because at the end of the day, as a landowner, you want to be able to fish your cut bait, right? You've given me this, this, this contract for a solar lease that says that you're going to pay me X number of dollars per acre for the term of the lease. Let's fish your cut bait. Let's either do it or not, right? Understanding, of course, that these things do take do do take some time, but there's certainly some push and some pull there between the developer and the landowner about how long that should be. And from my perspective, from the perspective of the landowner, I think that the shorter, the better. The operations term, uh, I've seen anything from 20 to 60 to 70 years. Uh, these are going to be very long-term agreements. Uh, one thing to consider is, should the term of the agreement be tied to the life of the actual installation, whether it's the solar farm or the wind turbine or whatever it is? Uh, termination of these things in all of the le leases that I have seen is um, not terribly difficult for the developer. It is nearly impossible for the landowner. And so that is one thing that all landowners need to make sure that they understand is that, and by the way, this makes sense, right? If you're a solar developer, you don't want to sign a lease for a whole bunch of acres, sink the money into installing a whole bunch of panels on the, on the, on the property, and then five years later, have the landowner come and say, ah, you know what, I don't like this. You got to take these things off, right? That wouldn't make sense. That wouldn't be economically viable. And so honestly, that makes sense. Um, but landowners need to understand, they need to do their due diligence because once this thing gets installed, uh, outside of just not receiving any payments at all, any, any of the contractually required lease, lease payments, uh, there's just not a good opportunity for a developer, or I'm, I'm sorry, for a landowner to terminate these agreements. If we want to flip to the next slide now, um, this is something that initially, so I started doing these, these presentations for Illinois landowners back in 2016, when there was some initial develop or some initial interest that we were hearing about from solar developers, which I thought was totally bizarre, right? It's, it's, it's Illinois, this is not California, this is not Arizona. It's, uh, it's frequently cloudy, or I feel like it's been cloudy here for the last 90 days. Um, and so it's got, and so I thought, gosh, this is, this, this, this could not be legitimate to build solar farms here in Illinois. And I was wrong. Um, so previously, all of the lease agreements that I saw would have something in there about a warranty of title. You know, landowner warrants that they have fee simple title, for example. And that was something that I might put as some little bullet point. I wouldn't even usually talk about it, anything other than that. Just say, oh, yeah, you got a warranty you have title of the property. Well, as these solar developments and actually, so as the solar developments and actually two wind developments have gone farther south in Illinois. Previously, it was all wind farms and they were all in central and northern Illinois. There was very little wind development, in fact, none in the, in the, in the southern part of the state. Um, and as wind development went, creeped a little bit farther south on the map and the solar development came and it started up north and then also more quickly crept down south. Uh, in Southern Illinois, uh, there was a lot of mineral interests that were severed uh, back in, who knows when, 100 years ago or something. Um, and so I think it's important for any landowner that might be considering something like this to talk to their lawyer and to look at that warranty of title provision and say, okay, the SOAR developer wants me to warrant that I have a certain amount of title, a fee simple title or something like that. What title do I actually have? Do I have any mineral interests that were severed? And if I do, what does that mean? Uh, in Illinois, that's frequently going to mean that the owner of the mineral interest has uh, basically an easement to use the surface, as much of the surface as they need uh, to, to extract the minerals that they own below, which obviously, if we're talking about solar in, in particular, uh, that could be a problem if there was a property that was covered with solar farms five years later, uh, the owner of, of the mineral interest comes and says, hey, listen, we need to use the surface of this so we can extract the minerals. You got to move these solar panels, 
uh, sword developer is going to say, we're not moving them. Uh, and there's going to be a fight between those two. And at the end of the day, all fingers are going to then point to the landowner because sword, because, uh, sword developer is going to say, well, hold on. Landowner told us that they own this property in fee simple. There was no severed mineral interest. And mineral owner is going to say, well, I don't know. Landowner sold this to us. So, so we ought to. We obviously have this easement there. And so all fingers are going to point to landowner and landowner is going to be the one that is, uh, that, that is going to face some liability there. So uh, again, it's important to talk to your attorney to know what exactly, what, what, what you actually own on this property and what you're telling any solar or wind developer that you actually own. Uh, I've seen exclusivity zones where basically once you sign a lease, you're giving that individual solar or wind developer the right to develop future solar or wind installations on any property that you own within a certain radius. I've seen up to five miles, one to five miles. So if you sign a lease with solar developer A, uh, the, act, the solar project actually gets built. After a few years, you're saying, hey, wow, this is actually great. Solar developer B comes and says, hey, listen, you have a section of property that's a mile down the road we'd like to enter into a lease agreement for another solar farm on that property. And you say, oh, well, this one, the one with solar developer A is working very well. Let's go to solar developer B and let's do something similar. A could then come back and say, no, 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 no. We have an exclusive uh, opportunity to develop solar on this radius that's, that, that's around this, this current property. So you got to tell them no. Uh, just make sure that if something like, like that's in there, that you know what it is, and that you know that it's there, and that you're comfortable with it. And if you're not, uh, work with your attorney uh, with your attorney to uh, try to negotiate something. Um, usually, in all of the leases that I have seen, there is a provision that escalates the rent over time. Uh, the standard that I have seen is two percent per year, and sometimes it might start after five years, something like that. Uh, so, if it's a thousand bucks an acre, it goes up two percent every year for you know the life of the lease. Um, like I say, the standard that I have seen has been 2%. It is interesting because, so I graduated law school in 2006. So I've been practicing law for about 15 to 16 years now. For basically all of that time since I have been practicing law, interest rates have been very low. Um, inflation has been very, very low. Uh, in fact, prior to the last year or two, uh, the Federal Reserve was frequently sort of concerned and, re and wringing their hands because inflation was maybe a little bit too low. They wanted to goose inflation up a little bit. Well, now we are in a, a far different landscape economically than we were in 2006, 7, 8, and basically the whole time that I've been practicing law, uh, where we have high inflation, 7% year over year. Uh, and we don't know when that inflation might come down. Uh, so with that in mind, consider if your lease agreement says there is a 2% escalator, is that sufficient? Um, previously, that would probably be sufficient. Uh, today, I'm not so sure it is. So let's flip to the next slide and we can talk about decommissioning and, and uh, Oh, actually, no, I'm sorry. Forgot about insurance. This is also one of those issues that I used to just sort of skip over because I didn't think it was important. You need to make sure if you own property and you are interested in a solar or a wind turbine, a solar project or a wind turbine, you need to make sure that you talk to your insurance agent and, so, and say, okay, what are the consequences of this? We are hearing frequently from, from landowners who are talking to their agents who are saying, you know, I've got a sort of developer that wants to, you know, farm um, or that wants to install a sort of a sort development on a part of my property. The other part of my property, I'm still going to be farming. Um, my lease with the developer says that I have to carry some insurance. And I just want to make sure that my general farm policy covers me, even though half of my property might be in solar panels. And what we are hearing more and more frequently is insurance companies saying, no, uh, this is not farm use. This is solar development and you're leasing up to someone else for that. This is, this is something wholly different and no, you are not covered with that. Um, and so just make sure that you talk to your insurance uh, 
carrier about what the consequences of that might be. So let's flip to the next slide now. And uh, we can talk about restoration of the land. Um, decommissioning is a big deal. And again, this is where that three-legged stool, you might have some of those other legs in terms of a county zoning ordinance and maybe some, some state statutes that might come in. Um, these are often some of the issues that are talked about when it comes to decommissioning a, uh, a solar or a wind project on farmland. Uh, there's gonna be some compaction issues uh, that is especially true with, with uh, um, wind development. They bring in huge cranes that weigh many, many, many tons, and those huge cranes are going to cause compaction, which in Illinois and in the upper Midwest is certainly going to be an issue. Um, if you want to flip to the next slide, when it comes to decommissioning, Illinois has tried to get out in front of some of that, and they uh, passed what is called the Renewable Energy Facilities Agricultural Impact Mitigation Act. And there's the, there's the, the, uh, the uh, site for it for those of you that are interested. It is intended, and it doesn't always work this way, unfortunately, but is it, it is intended to establish some minimum restoration standards for uh, ag land specifically that has been impacted by construction, deconstruction, and operations. Um, and it is not intended to to address every single issue that might be associated with wind or solar development, but it's intended to at least give us some sort of minimum protections. And if we wanna to flip to the next slide, we can see what some of those are. Um, it requires concrete removal up to five feet. That is particularly important with wind projects, right? Where, we, where the base of the wind turbine is going to have 20 feet of concrete. In it. Removal of underground cabling of up to five feet. There are specific provisions for how to repair damaged drainage tile lines, which again, in the Southern US, Oklahoma, um, Texas, the fight is rarely probably over where the water goes, it's who gets to keep it. In Illinois, by the way, I'm from Idaho, uh, there was never a fight over where the water goes, it was over who gets to keep it. And so when I moved to Illinois, it was a completely different ballgame where it's, it's okay, who's going to take this water? That's often done through underground uh, uh, drainage tile lines. And when those lines get damaged, it can be a big deal. Uh, and so there are specific provisions in this AMA, we call it the Agricultural Impact Mitigation Agreement that deal with uh, uh, re repairing tile lines. Uh, talks about how to repair compaction and, and rutting, repairing soil conservation practices. And then also there's some important provisions in there about about um, construction during wet weather, which there has been a number of issues with. Uh, construction during wet weather is, has been an issue not only with uh, renewable energy projects in this state, but also with pipelines and transmission lines. So if you wanna flip over to the next slide, the, I think what I'll sort of finish off with is uh, also before you do this, you, you need to go and talk with uh, the people at the FSA, at your local FSA office and figure out what the consequences of doing something like this might be. Um, specifically, uh, what I think a risk could be is losing out on base acres. So again, if you have the 100 acre property, um, you have 100 acres of base presumably, and if you cover that property, and this goes for solar in particular, because like Shannon said, wind, you might only have a, you know, a few acres that might be taken out of production. Solar, it might be the whole thing. So if you cover the property with solar panels, what happens to your base? Um, in many instances, that base might go away and it might never come back. So you would wanna make sure that you understood exactly what the consequences of something like this might be in terms of uh, farm program payments. Uh, CRP, uh, if you have some property in CRP that might be used for wind and, wind and solar development, then you've got to kind of assume uh, that you're gonna breach that contract and that you're going to owe any payments that you've received previously as well. So with that, I'll turn it over uh, back to Tyne and, and uh, we can, I can uh, stick around to answer some questions at the Q&A.
Yes, thank you, Garrett. And I think um, there were a lot of details there. We have some questions coming in. So I will definitely dive into those, Garrett, as, as soon as we finish up. So thank you so much. I appreciate it, Garrett. All right, our next speaker, Howard Halderman, President and CEO of Halderman Farm Management, Halderman Real Estate Services, and Executive Chair of U.S. Agriculture. He's accountable for overseeing the day-to-day -day operations at Halderman companies. And so you're probably very familiar with Halderman and some of the work that they've done. Um, you know, when you look at U.S. agriculture and developing the strategic direction of the, of the firms, he's been key in that. The Halderman companies oversee farmland assets for over 1,100 clients in 22 different states. And in total, uh, that equates to 240,000 acres. They also buy and sell via private treaty and at auction more than $120 million in farmland in the Midwest and perform over 1,000 appraisals of farmland annually. U.S. agriculture has over $400 million in agricultural assets and commitments under management for four institutional clients. He has a bachelor's degree in agricultural economics from Purdue University. And Howard, I imagine you have been extremely busy over the past 12 months. I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Tyne. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak to the forum today. And uh, we have a uh, had the opportunity to do solar leasing on a number of farms as well as actually selling some land for solar development and that then if you go back 15 20 years i would agree with what garrett just said wind energy in the state of indiana is mature and honestly getting a wind project approved today i think would be fairly challenging in most locales so a lot of my comments today are going to focus more on the solar leasing because that seems to be the hot topic of the moment uh, but I do have some uh, thoughts on wind as well. So next uh, slide. This just really details uh, some of the work that we've done in the solar arena since the spring of 2020. And that's really where things started to kick off here in the state of Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, and, and Kentucky for us, is we started to see a lot of solar companies coming into the Eastern Corn Belt and wanting to develop or at least put in lease options to look at developments for solar projects and I'm talking about commercial scale, multiple hundreds of acres of, of land going into solar development. And you can see that by the end of last year, we were around 14,000 acres under a lease option. Next slide. So a lot, I'll try not to be redundant with what uh, Shannon and Garrett uh, spoke about, but we've talked about where solar development could go. And a lot of times these companies are looking for green zones, open environmentally safe land for solar. What fits that? Well, obviously open fields. Uh, what we've seen, most solar companies do not want to go into uh, clearing woods, clearing vegetation. Uh, so you really won't see that part of your property impacted. Uh, they also are not going to go into an area where there's endangered or threatened species habitat. They're not going to do wetlands. They're not going to do floodplains. So you think, oh, well, I'm going to take that river bottom field and put it into solar. And it probably won't work for them. Uh, next slide, please. So there are other places that solar development could occur and is occurring a lot of times in more metropolitan areas. You think about some of the brownfield areas and communities where you live, super fun sites, aged landfills, gravel pits. Uh, opportunity zones is an area that uh, some solar companies are looking at here in the state of Indiana. Going down the road, parking lots, carports, canopies over those parking lots, big rooftops, buildings. Solar has gone on to rooftops of residential homes. Um, so solar has a lot of different applications going forward to places where it can go, maybe even roadways and sidewalks in the future. So next slide. So why would a landowner think about a solar lease? And as I think about it, there, there are some key reasons why you might think about this. One is just the farm and family income. We're gonna talk about lease rates here in a second because uh, my job here is to talk more about the commercial aspect of this. But this is an opportunity probably to look at two and a half to three times the farm income that you've been achieving if you just compare it to a cash rental rate. Uh, you can secure the farm's generational future. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're farming 5,000 acres and you have 500 acres go into a solar farm, with the revenue that comes from that with very little cost to you, the landowner, if any cost, uh, basically, that could be a funding source that helps secure the generational future of your farm uh, on into the future. You diversify your income stream. You're basically farming a different crop. 
you're using instead of using sun energy to grow corn or grow soybeans or wheat or whatever uh, crop you're growing, you're actually just producing electricity and it's with no additional costs. You enable your farm to grow. Uh, I would suggest, and I, I think uh, we've one of the pushbacks that we've seen to solar here in Indiana is that the people who do are able to have a solar uh, commercial scale uh, unit on their project on their farm, well, they might be able to pay more competitive cash rents. They might be able to buy more land. So could you en this enable your farm to grow and expand because you've diversified this income stream? It is a very low cost of entry for the landowner. And then there are some environmental benefits beyond the economic that you see on solar. Underneath those solar panels, they're going to plant some sort of cover crop. It's going to reduce erosion. You know, it's not going to be bare soil underneath those panels. It'll have some kind of uh, crop underneath there. It may even include strips of a pollinator habitat. So that enhances the bee population in your community. And at the end of the day, you, you get reduced runoff of water, soil, and fertilizer and pesticides. So in theory, around a solar, a commercial scale solar development, you're going to have less impact on the environment and the community around it. Next slide. Community enhancement. So when these large scale solar developments come into a community, the increased assessed valuation of those solar panels, of that development, of the wind turbines is all picked up by those developers. And that increases the assessed valuation of that county, of that township, you know, however that is done in the various states that you're located. That could either be used to reduce real estate taxes because you have a higher assessed valuation, the tax bills, uh, the, the amount needed by the county is the same, so it could be reduced real estate taxes for everybody else, or it could be increased tax revenue if the rate stays the same. And one would argue that you could look at improved infrastructure, better schools, maybe your football stadium gets a turf field instead of a grass field, maybe you improve the roads or bridges instead of gravel, uh, the roads become chip and seal. Uh, maybe uh, broadband can be spread throughout the county. Uh, so it really would be up to the county to decide how they use that additional tax revenue. But you can improve the quality of life. You could, at the end of the day, attract more people to your community and really promotes the long-term viability and growth. But basically that concept, all boats will rise because of this kind of new utility scale electric generation facility coming into your county. Next slide, please. So I think Garrett talked about a lot of these, these lease terms. Uh, it is a long-term lease. You got to get it right up front. Uh, Garrett identified some of those things you really need to look at, as did Shannon. That option to development term, we've seen anywhere from two to five years. Shorter is better. Uh, but five years is pretty normal for that lease option development term. Uh, I would suggest you want to definitely have landowner approval of the site plan. You know, where are they going to put the panels? Where's the fencing going to be around that? What are the setbacks? And many times in many counties, you're going to see that plan commission have an ordinance around renewable energy. And they're going to have some rules that those developers, be it wind or solar, are going to have to comply with. And a lot of times it is a setback requirement. Uh, I can tell you from what I've heard from solar developers in the Eastern Corn Belt, if a quarter mile setback is the plan commission solar ordinance, that's gonna eliminate a lot of solar development, if not all, in most counties in the Eastern Corn Belt because of the higher density residential development that we have. And so when you're uh, sitting on a plan commission and you want solar development to come to your community, maybe you wanna look at a setback that's much less than that. So that, that really, that site planning and approval process becomes pretty critical. As Garrett said, operational term you know, could be really even longer than 25 to 35 years, but that's been the norm that we've seen. You can certainly see renewal options. A lot of times it's two renewal options, five years each. Um, the solar and wind company does reserve the right to terminate. It's kind of unilateral in that uh, regard. The landowner really can't. Um, and if you do a solar lease, because it's taking all of the field, I certainly would want to have some protection if they decide to terminate part of that lease. Meaning, well, we're gonna just develop the key middle part of that 80 acres and leave you the periphery. Eh, that's not really what you wanna farm. Uh, so I think having some protection on what that partial termination might look like is important. Next slide. So what's the rent? What, what, what does this mean economically to you? 
Well, in some instances, there might be a signing bonus. If you sign your lease option with us, you get a, a bonus payment. That's eh, not often, but sometimes that happens. What does happen in every time is a lease option payment. And so you're gonna get 20 to 40, maybe $50 per acre per year for that option period. And so that's when they're doing their studies. They're gonna have the right to go out there and do the soil testing and, and the other testing that Garrett mentioned. And they're gonna pay you 20 to 40 to $50 an acre uh, for that, right? And they do their studies and maybe they're trying to sell the electricity. And they go through all of that process before they start the construction period. And they also are gonna seek county approval during that time period and state approval. So they're not gonna hinder you in any way from continuing your row crop farming, your pasture, whatever you're using that farm for, you can continue all of those uses. Now, if they do any damage of crops, you know, that's important to have written in there. What are the crop damage terms? They will reimburse you for all of that. And so you just need to make sure that uh, is protecting you appropriately. The construction period then, either for wind or for solar, is a step up in lease rate. And so when they start construction, they may not pay you 100% of operational rent. Uh, it's kind of 50 to 100. Solar is kind of the same. I, I said usually the same as operational rent. It really depends on the lease. Ideally, uh, when they go in and they, they start to develop for solar, they're going to take that whole field. So you really want that operational rent if you can get it, but sometimes it's gonna be a some lesser rate than full operational uh, rent when they're commercially selling the electricity. Crop damage, as I mentioned, uh, you need to have that spelled out in that lease and lease option. Compaction is an issue. Uh, what happens when uh, the, the solar construction starts and running transmission lines and all of that. Tile damage provisions is important. And then I hadn't thought of this until I heard a presentation just a month ago, uh, an attorney here in Indiana mentioned he had negotiated a solar lease for a landowner and the solar company came in and started grading the field. Uh, that doesn't work in the Eastern Corn Belt. The minute you do that, you're gonna have subsoil uh, without topsoil and ever putting that farm back the way it was is just not gonna be possible. So that is something you certainly want to have a prohibition on in your uh, lease option, that they cannot grade the field. Uh, I think the, the developer, that guy's actually doing the work, we're looking at it, well, like they were developing a McDonald's site and they were gonna make that a flat lot. Um, well, that doesn't work in, in uh, destruction of, and you wanna put the farm back the way it was at the end of the lease. So uh, be careful with that. Next slide, please. So operational rent, uh, wind. Most of those turbines are going to pay, and, and the nice thing is, a lot of the wind energy developments that we saw and that were successful here in Indiana, they not only paid the people who had the turbines, but they paid the people who were impacted by the overall wind development, because it certainly changes the aesthetics of living in that community. There is additional noise, there, it changes your view, uh, because those turbines are so tall, and there are some impacts to the community. So they were making payments, not just to the landowner with the turbine, but also to those neighbors that were affected. But with, if you have that turbine, you're probably getting five to $12,000 per turbine. And there, it can go up from there, depending on how they're selling the electricity. It depends on the size of the turbine. We heard about one that Garrett mentioned that was decommissioned and they put in bigger turbines. So those numbers can vary. Um, but that, that really does add value to the farm because it's an income stream that can now be capitalized uh, into the value. Solar is a little more basic. It's going to be so many dollars per acre, and they're taking, they tend to take the entire field, $700 to $1,200 per acre. Depends on the size of the project. It depends on the location of the project. Uh, I've actually seen rents less than $700 as you go further west. And it's really what it comes down to is more of a multiple of your cropland lease rate. And so two and a half to three to four times is kind of the range that we've seen. Um, I would want to have in there a minimum acreage protection. Uh, that basically means that they can't take just a small piece and then the area leave you trying to farm the periphery. Uh, inflation factor, Garrett covered this. We do see 2% typically, have seen two and a half in solar leases. Most solar companies don't want to do a CPI. Uh, I can appreciate why, because it was 7% last quarter. Uh, but if you're the landowner, you know, 2% up until last year would have looked pretty attractive. 
now what do you want it to be going in the future so the other thing is is when does that appreciation start sometimes i've seen in a solar lease it starts at year five uh, i would want it to start from the very outset of commercial production and then late fees and interest what happens if they are late on a payment and making sure you have the appropriate fees and interest in there i think is important next slide so easement language, you know, are they taking an easement over other property? Um, so th that would be where they're wanting to run transmission lines to try to get to the uh, grid, basically to a large overhead line. Sometimes those easement fees are paid for by the lineal foot, $4 is an example. Uh, and that's, so that might be an opportunity for a landowner. They may not have solar on their property, but they may have an easement for a, a transmission line going across. Are the transmission lines overhead or underground? I think uh, underground is ideal, um, but sometimes they're overhead because of the, the capacity uh, that they're transmitting. Battery storage, you heard Shannon mention that this is kind of new. Initially, a couple of years ago when we started doing solar, this really wasn't part of the equation, but now most solar developments are going to have a clause in there for battery storage. And that is probably those in substations, those might be acres you choose to sell and you actually sell two to three, four acres for the battery storage and the substation, and that could be 25,000 an acre, it could be 50,000 an acre. The, that's more of a commercial price at that point. Um, and the reason for selling it is that there could be an environmental risk, right? Uh, when you're talking about batteries sitting on your property, I'd really want the solar developer to own those, those acres. And so where those are located, that's again, why you want that plan approval in your, in your process. And then the last point here, fencing, setbacks, natural break, what is the impact on irrigation units? Uh, all those things are important when you think about a wind turbine or you think about uh, a solar development. They're gonna fence a solar development. Sometimes setbacks could be 100 feet from a property line, 350 feet from a residence. Uh, those, are some, those are some numbers that a solar developer gave me that they, they like to work with. When you start to get to a quarter mile, 1,320 feet, then that becomes really uh, just an elimination of solar in the Eastern Corn Belt. How do they treat a fencing all along a county road? A lot of times it's gonna be just a, a chain link or a woven wire fence, but around a residence, maybe they put more of a natural break, meaning mounding or trees. Some of those things can be negotiated as well. And then obviously impact on irrigation. What does it do to your irrigation units if you're going to continue to farm part of the farm? Next slide, please. Miscellaneous, uh, they are gonna probably have a clause in their lease about assignability. Well, who can they assign it to? Do you have the right to have a say in that? Might be something to look into. Uh, Garrett mentioned insurance coverage. That obviously is always important to making sure they're covering all of that, especially with electricity being generated. Property tax. A lot of most of the time the landowner pays what they historically have been paying on the property and the developer pays everything over and above that make sure that's written into the lease option and the lease the environmental issues for substations for battery storage do you want environmental benefits do you want to require them to plant a pollinator habitat what kind of cover crops might you want they're not going to put fertilizer down so what does that field come back to you like well, you, I, you know, shouldn't have any erosion, right? And it should have increased organic matter. If it has a pollinator habitat, maybe it has some legumes in there, you're not gonna get much in the way of fertilizer enhanced, fertility enhancement, but you certainly can get soils in a better soil health position than when you started. Then the restoration requirements, and I thought Garrett did a really nice job about talking about these. Make sure you have that decommissioning bond if the, the, the developer ends up going away at the end of the lease. You've got something you can tap into to at least finance the, the rep, uh, reclamation of the land. Um, removal security, you know, does it start early enough and is it adequate? Uh, I've had solar developers tell me, no, at, you know, up till year 10, uh, the lease payments will be made even if the solar developer goes defunct because the credit, the, the bank in this case, will step in and make those payments because the value of the panels are so much. I don't know whether they are or they aren't, but that when that kicks in, I think is pretty important in how you negotiate it. And then do you want a sale option? I mentioned this because I did that. I had a client in Texas, the farm was in Northeast Texas, and he said, I, I bought this farm to farm. I don't want to lease it for solar. Economically, the solar lease was a better deal for him, but he chose to sell it. He said, if they wanna do it, then just have them buy it from me and, and he sold it. 
So that is an option as well. Next slide, please. And then a very evaluation. So how do you value renewable acres? Well, we talked about that. I think Shannon mentioned that that could be uh, something in, the, in her presentation. But if wind, we've seen it generate another five to $1,000 an acre in value over a farm, a comparable farm that does not have a wind turbine on it. And most of the time, that is just a pure capitalization. So if you had $8,000 a year in annual income from a wind turbine on a property, and it was 100 acres in size, you can see the numbers here. If you use a 6% discount rate, you can argue if that's high or low, you pick that number. Uh, you know, farmland today is generating two and a half to three. I think it ought to be more than that, a uh, higher discount rate, because there is some risk uh, of, of payment and things you can't control. So if it's 6%, then your, your value is $1,300 an acre on 100 acres. So that's one way to think about wind. Solar, honestly, as Garrett said, most of these are being developed now. So we have very few comparable sales, if any, where a farm has had solar developed on it, is it at commercial production and sells. So I really don't have great numbers there, uh, but if you do the same kind of mathematical calculation, if you got a thousand dollar per acre lease rate and you use the 6% discount rate, well, that would equate to land value of 16,666 an acre. Farmland rent of 300 divided by a 2.75 cap rate, which is a typical cap rate in farmland, that's 10,900. Uh, obviously, farmland has been trading significantly higher, 12,000, 15,000 here in Indiana is not unheard of. Um, so, you know, what, how that compares. Uh, the other thing about this, and if you go to the next slide, I think that uh, one of the things is net usable acres when you need to think about that when you do evaluation of a solar development. Um, how many acres of productive $1,000 an acre are you receiving those payments on? And then what can you do with the, with the rest of the acres? Or are they paying you $1,000 an acre on the entire 80 acre parcel? And if it's across the whole 80 acres, even though they're using 75 or 70 of that, um, then it doesn't really bother you as the landowner because you're getting paid for everything. So again, that's part of the negotiation of that lease. Um, and you know, like, I, like the last point here, net farmable acres are like, likely a higher percentage than what the solar use acres will be. So that's just part of your math as you uh, compare whether this is a lease for you or not. Next slide. So lease option and lease timeline, I think we, we've covered a lot of this. The, the landowner enters into that lease option agreement. It's anywhere from zero to, to five years. Uh, the landowner probably can help in assisting, recruiting other landowners in the area. You think about it, they want those pieces, those parcels in close proximity, if not contiguous, because they don't want to run transmission lines long distances. And so the closer they can get those, the better. Those are your neighbors. You know these folks. You might, if you like the solar development, obviously you've signed the lease option. You probably do. You want it to happen. You might recruit other landowners to participate. And then once a landowner achieves, a developer achieves critical mass, and they define what that is. Maybe it's 1,000 acres. Maybe it's 3,000 acres. Then they're going to start the approval process, working with the county, working with the state, and going through and, and checking all the boxes that are required to. Next slide. And then you can plan on that to take maybe a year, two years. Uh, you think about zoning, plan commission, state regulatory, might include satisfactory sale of the electricity, and sometimes that's bid out. They got to do their due diligence, soil testing, site inspections, uh, measuring the amount of sun, measuring the amount of wind. Um, so those things occur during that time period. And then construction can be one to three years. Again, it depends on the size of the project and how, you know, what kind of scale it is and how long that can take. Uh, but it will take a, a, a year or so to get a, a project developed. And then it would go into commercial production. So you can kind of think about the payment stream during those time periods. And then as Garrett said, damage clause is extremely important uh, so that you protect yourself in the development process so that when they're doing their testing, you still get reimbursed for crop damages. And then likewise, um, what happens if the, it's developed and they decommission it many years down the road? Next slide. And that is, that is all I have. So I think Tyne at this point, I'll turn it over to you. I know questions have been funneling in. So let's open it up to questions and go from there. Uh, 
Yeah, quite a few questions. So thank you so much. All right. Some of them have been answered uh, a little bit in, in the Q&A. Some of the written answers are there, but I, there, there are some of these that I think we need to talk about anyway. So I'm going to start off with Shannon. Uh, Shannon Dell asks, the NREL shows the major resource for wind is offshore compared to the interior of our country, which they show is only marginally effective. Um, why are your numbers different? Oh, Shannon, I think you're still on mute. How many times has that phrase been said over Zoom in the past two years? I apologize so much. Um, so the map that I was showing everybody was the onshore wind resource map that's put out by NREL, the National Renewable Energy um, Laboratory, which, by the way, has some phenomenal resources. Go to their website. They do a really good job of making a lot of available resources uh, accessible for a large range of renewable questions. Um, now, if we were to show you the offshore map, boy, it would look a lot different. And you would see that there are tremendous wind resources offshore, both on the Pacific and the Atlantic. I did have a slide in my presentation. I didn't talk about it that much when we had that levelized cost of energy. If you look at the bottom of that slide, right above battery power is offshore wind. So right now, offshore is just a lot more expensive per megawatt hour than the other resources are. But true, that, that cost has been trending down sharply. And we're starting to see some of the very first projects be built in the United States. I think you're gonna see that as a big trend in the next 10 to 20 years, because we've already seen that um, offshore in Northern Europe, especially the UK, where they have tremendous offshore resources that are a big chunk of their national generation. Does anyone else, um, Garrett, do you wanna add anything to that? No, I think that's good. Okay, Garrett, the next question's for you. Russell asks, are there any examples of compensation for future yield loss due to installation, restoration on the area surrounding that solar or wind location? The agreements that I have seen call for usually a one-time payment where they try to estimate for the next three years what any yield loss might be. So again, it's kind of a guess. There's sort of you know a formula that's based on you know, futures prices and things like that. But the ones that I have seen generally include some sort of like a damage provision for uh, for future yield loss, but it is a fairly short time. Okay. A year, something like that. Yeah, Shannon or Howard, anyone want to add to that? Yeah, the, the damage clauses we've seen have basically been when the damage actually occurs that year. It's an average price from that year and then yield from surrounding acres. So if you've got a, uh, we had a, an instance in Texas where four wheelers went out to do their soil sampling. The we, we basically had a GPS unit, they, the developer did on the, the four wheelers. We knew exactly where they went. We knew the width and the damage in the wheat that occurred. And we were able to measure that and then compare it to the yield and the rest of the field times the price that the farmer got. And so that was the way we compensated for those damages. All right, Robert asks, Garrett, let's go to the lender side of this. What are some issues that lenders need to be made aware of in the leases? Well, um, first of all, uh, almost every lease that I have seen says something about landowner says that they don't have any mortgages. So um, if landowner did have a mortgage, they'd wanna make sure that they disclose that to the, to, to, to the developer. Um, and then from there, there's usually a whole bunch of language in the leases that I have seen about protecting the developers' lenders, right? Uh, about making sure that the developers' lenders' mortgages are you know, priority and all of that stuff. And there's usually very little in there about protecting the landowners' lenders. Um, and so I guess what I would say is, first and foremost, um, working with uh, with your borrowers to make sure that they understand that, you know, if you, if you do something like this, you got to make sure. I mean, ideally, I think if you have a good relationship with your borrowers and landowners with their lenders, that you would, you know, maybe even touch base and just say, hey, listen, this is where we're at on this. Um, because Obviously, with the lender, if they don't touch base, I mean, they're just going to sign an agreement and then you don't know. Uh, of course, at that point, you know, if it were to come down to, you know, a court litigation over, you know, I don't know of what effect a landowner might be able to, to do to a mortgage just based on his signing something. So I guess I would say that there are definitely some issues um, and, that, and that every lease that I have seen 
takes great pains to protect the sewer or the wind developers, lenders, but not so much the landowners, which I guess makes sense. How about anything you want to add to that? Oh, Shannon, you want to add to that? Well, just real quickly, I actually did this because, again, nerd. The average length of a wind lease in my file is 40 pages. Roughly 20 of those pages are devoted to exactly what Garrett was talking about right there. It's all the protections for the lenders because, you know, debt financing for these projects is, is usually huge. So a couple of things about that. Number one, don't be scared if you see language that talks about, hey, we need this project to be saleable, you know, to another developer. As a landowner, if you want the project and you want the revenues, you also want that project to be sellable because that increases its probability of getting built and operating and generating those royalty revenues that you want. But the other side of that too, and this goes exactly to a point that Garrett raised, in terms of protections for your lender, which is, you know, if you're a farmer, that's kind of important, right? You wanna have a very good relationship with your lender. Look out for language that says that the landowner is going to be required to secure what's called a subordination, non-disturbance, and a tournament right. agreement from their lender. I'm going to feel a little awkward going to my lender and saying, hey, I know you loaned me at a really good interest rate the money to buy this farm over a 30-year note, but do you mind getting in line behind these other guys who just came along? That's tough. I'm okay with language in the agreement that says, as the landowner, I won't get in the way and I'll, I'll facilitate and cooperate with you getting that developer, but I'm not going to be the one asking for that because that jeopardizes the relationship I have with my lender. Howard, we talked to legally, Garrett and Shannon both, both chimed in legally, but anything you want to add to that based on some of the experiences that you've had? In my experience, the key is that the farmer or the landowner communicates with their lender and just says, hey, we're looking at doing this. What thoughts and, imp and input do you have on it? What, what feedback do you have? Or is there language you would recommend we include in a lease that protects you, farm credit, XYZ bank, you know, whoever it is? Because usually that communication, if you have open two-way communication with your lender, that's what they're looking for. They, they want to know what you're thinking. They can look at this and say, great, this means we're going to get paid, paid off. Uh, but they could also look at it and say, no, I don't want to be subordinated. So that could, they could actually help maybe less than the legal bill for the landowner because that, that lender can kind of step in and make sure their interests are protected, which obviously then also helps us the landowner too. Another question that came in, John asks, is the price a developer receives in selling power discoverable? I mean, have you seen any leases where the landowner's compensation is based on how much the developer receives? Shannon, I know you typed an answer into that um, in the Q&A function. And just a reminder, if you have a question to ask, that Q&A function's at the lower right-hand corner. Uh, but Shannon and Garrett, anything you want to add to that, Shannon? I'll start with you. So one thing, and we actually have a, a USDA NEFA grant that we're working on a multi-state project to get more market information into the hands of producers, because most of these contracts have non-disclosure agreements and they're trying to keep you know, the prices that are being paid very close to the vest. But obviously that creates an asymmetry of information for the landowner so we get more of that out there. So we're working on it. So if anybody has a lease, they wouldn't mind shooting our way. We won't say where we got it. We'll scrub everything off. It'll be anonymized, but we'd, we'd love to see that. Um, to a limited extent, it is possible to see the, the price that developers are getting for the power. Um, you've got to do some homework on that and look at your you know, information from your public utility commission in your state or look at the power purchase agreements. If those are part of a rate case that appears before your utility commission, you can be out there. Now, a little bit less so in solar, more so in wind. We do see lots of royalty arrangements, which you know, and Garrett kind of, and, and Howard both talked about this where the landowner is receiving a portion of what are called the gross revenues from power sales. Landowners be really careful about making sure that you have complete transparency to know what that price is so you can determine if you're being paid accurately. Here in Oklahoma, we do have a statute that's kind of an analog to our oil and gas statute that says you have a pay stub that shows the revenues that have got and to make sure that you're getting that royalty payment you know, reflected correctly. I've seen that less in solar and solar. I've seen a lot more prevalence of fixed prices. And I think that's been a function of the economics of solar compared to wind, but I don't know if we'll see that shift over time as that matures, but, but Garrett, anything else that you'd want to add to that? Just from the perspective of solar, I have never seen anything other than a fixed rent per acre payment. Uh, wind, like Shannon said, it's pretty common to see, 
you know, something other that's, you know, based on the production of the, of the turbine. I've never seen that with solar. Yeah, I agree. Okay, perfect. Uh, another question that came in, John asks, given the 30 plus year term of the leases, what work has been done to estimate whether the compensation offered by the developer is a good deal considering long-term value of farmland, long-term value of energy production, crop prices, et cetera. Um, and, you know, Howard, I know this question came in, I think when you were speaking. So do you want to take this one first? I guess I've not uh, seen any research that's been done uh, on the long-term nature of it. I think that's where that CPI or the inflation clause becomes pretty critical. Uh, when I, I did the analysis on the deal in Texas that we did, now that was a four multiple lease rate. So our cash rent that we were receiving for farm operations, the, the payment they were going to lease the farm for for solar was four times that. Um, and so we did the comparable, you know, present value and the present value of the farm was higher under the lease than it was under the sale. Uh, that's not what my client chose to do, uh, but things are probably going to look different today with the current inflation rate that we're seeing than what they were then. Uh, but, you know, there, there is a way that you can compute the present value of the farm and kind of compare it. Now, when you're talking maybe just a two to two and a half times lease rate, that probably makes that clo a little closer and you probably want a higher in, you know, inflation clause in that lease rate uh, to make sure you're staying ahead. It's worth, I haven't seen any numbers. I'm uh, curious what, uh, what uh, Shannon has to say about this from like a research perspective. I guess what I would say anecdotally is, you know, so from what I said at the outset, I don't represent any individual landowners in any of these negotiations, right? Um, but at least in Illinois, the first draft leases that I saw were back in 2016. And it seemed like the standard going rate was somewhere between six to 800 bucks an acre. Now here we are in 20, you know, well, I guess 2022. Um, but the now they are much higher than that. And I don't think that that is just because of inflation. Uh, I think that there was some supply and demand. I think that initially here in, in, in Illinois back in 2016, I think that it was, oh, you know, we can send out a whole bunch of letters to some people. We can try to get people signed up. Um, we won't develop all these projects. We're only gonna develop a small portion of these things. Um, and then we'll see who, who signs up for six or 800 bucks. Uh, over the course, even into 2019, the standard rate seemed to have increased more like a thousand. And then now I think they're, they're quite a bit higher than that. Um, so again, I don't, I don't have any research. I'm just talking sort of anecdotes. As an Oklahoma kid, I'm getting really jealous of the land prices and the lease rates you guys are seeing in the Corn Belt states. When I give my Oklahoma statistics up there, they usually laugh me out of the room, especially when I'm talking about lease rates. But if we want to talk about long term um, rate, rates, you know, one thing we want to talk about is the fact that, and I believe both Garrett and Howard mentioned this in their presentations, escalator clauses in your leases to adjust for inflation. And I've had knock down drag out fights with developers on this because the, the highest rate I've ever seen is a 2.5% annual escalator. When, when the long-term CPI average, if you go back as long as we've been calculating the CPI is 3.3, I'm like, well, look guys, you need to at least keep pace with inflation. And you know, Garrett made this point explicitly in his presentation over the course of both our respective legal careers, we've had virtually zero inflation. But as a farm kid of the 1980s, I remember when inflation was a little higher than, uh, you know, 2.5 or even 3.3. And so I, I'm a big fan of the CPI adjuster. If you can get that with the developer, and that's sometimes tough, but that at least makes things track. So you make sure that the buying power of your payments stays at least at parity with what your other expenses are. Um, and I suppose that goes to one other point that we haven't mentioned yet. It's tough to negotiate on your own. If you're a huge landowner, if you're, you know, if you're somebody that has 30,000 acres and can comprise the entire project, great, you've got a lot of leverage. But if you're one of many landowners, it may really behoove you to 
for lack of a better word, unionize with your fellow landowners around you and collectively negotiate. I've seen that work to pretty great benefit in a few cases, but you have to get landowners to work together. And we have a staying here in Oklahoma that sometimes we like to circle the wagons and shoot towards the inside. Um, so you actually have to work, not independently, but you know, cooperatively with your landowners if you're going to pull that off. Oh, yeah. And I would say, especially with wind, you know, because wind projects have such big footprints. And solar now we're seeing, like, I don't remember Shannon or Howard or both, solar projects are getting much bigger, you know, a few thousand acres. Um, but wind projects, when they have such huge footprints, uh, we, whenever I'm, I'm talking to uh, uh, groups of landowners, we always tell them the bargaining in groups, you always, always get a better deal. Um, yep, can't agree more. Like Shannon said, unless you own five, 10,000, 15,000 acres yourself, well, that might be a different story. But if you're a relatively small landowner within the footprint of a wind project, you are much better off um, getting together with a group of landowners. Honestly, within that group, interviewing a bunch of attorneys, picking the one that everyone feels best with, and then going that way. Uh, that's just, we, consistently, that is better. Yeah, and to that point, Garrett, uh, I, the developer actually prefers that because the developer wants to have one price across that whole thousand acres, 2000 acres, if it's a solar development, they want to offer the same thing because they get in real trouble, you know, pricing this guy's land higher than this guy's land. So uh, it actually can work well if they could get a, con a block of land of 2000 acres all contiguous and all working together with one attorney that makes it easier for them. Uh, right. They may actually pay a little more and it's a better deal for the landowners, uh, but it probably ends up being a win-win for both parties. Another quick quick point on this, most of the leases, well, wind, it is common at least here in Illinois for every wind lease to provide the landowner with a certain amount of money. Usually it's pretty small, 500 bucks, a thousand bucks for attorney's fees. Saying we want you to go to an attorney so here's 500 bucks, here's a thousand bucks, something like that. Um, listen, if it's going to be a negotiation, it's one thing to call an attorney and say, hey, listen, you know, what do you think? Here's my lease. And he might be able to sort of briefly read it over. And honestly, you're going to exhaust 500 bucks pretty quickly. But if you can get 20 people together and take that $500 or or a thousand dollars, that money's going to go a much longer way. Like I say, in Illinois, those provisions are common for the attorney's fees uh, with wind solar, you're getting to see them more and more. You know, Shannon, hearing a lot from younger producers right now that are concerned with this push to green energy, looking at, you know, rural areas as a way to deploy some of these efforts, that ultimately this creates too much competition for land and they're not able to grow their farming operation and they're concerned about what their future holds. Yes, there's revenue available. Yes, there's opportunity there. But as you, you know, talked about some of these projects that are so large and requiring so many acres, they're saying ultimately this creates even more competition for land. So before I ask Howard something on this front, Shannon or Garrett, anything that you want to add there is about some of the pitfalls, because I think there are some, some concerns for younger producers right now. Yeah, and you know, what I've seen, especially in Oklahoma, and I, I think this actually speaks to your point, is we actually got to the point where in Oklahoma, we drafted legislation that tied what was called the wind estate, if such a thing even exists, to the surface of the property. And the reason for that is that we had seen in oil and gas, you know, just incredible rates of severance of the mineral estate from the surface, which meant one party is getting benefit of the paychecks, the development of the mineral estate, but the surface estate is the one that's bearing the burden of the oil and gas production, all the activities there, the impairments, things of that sort, environmental impacts, et cetera, et cetera. I said, all right, we don't want that in wind. We're, we're gluing wind, and I think soon we'll probably see the same thing with solar, to the surface so that if someone sells a farm, then you should be getting the economic benefit of that energy production along with whatever the burdens are. You know, and somebody in the Q&A mentioned you know, the, the factor of externalities, and we're trying to tie those things together so those externalities are all borne by that, that surface estate there. You know, it's like I said, very different with wind than with solar, because with wind, it's very dispersed and you've got a lot of opportunity for agricultural operations within that wind energy project footprint. Very different with solar. And one thing that I've heard young producers telling me in Oklahoma time is exactly what you're talking about. We have what I believe is currently the largest project 
project, at least in the development phase that we're talking to landowners um, in the state, is about 3,000 acres for solar production. And it's in some of the state's breadbasket, you know, some of our highest producing hard red winter wheat uh, production ground. And producers are saying, isn't there anywhere else you could put solar panels in such a way that we aren't taking this cropland out of production? And, and can I have our cake and eat it too? And that's a very good question when we go about the land use decisions. You know, I mean, in Oklahoma, it's, it's very up to the landowner to decide if I want to sign this lease or not, because we don't have, we don't have state or county siting authority. It's, it's very much private, you know, choice there. But it's up to the developers and the landowners to say, you know, are we going to do this on prime agricultural land or are we going to go to more marginal lands to do that? So, I mean, yeah, I think it's a very real concern. And, and a lot of that goes to, especially with solar, how we go about our siting strategies and our siting policies to make sure that we're getting the most out of all of our, our land, um, whether for or renewable production or both. Garrett, anything you want to add on that front? Um, well, I think that the concerns about young farmers might be legitimate. Um, I don't really know if, if there's an easy answer to, you know, I don't think there's any magic solution. Um, about when it comes to siding, uh, I will say that, uh, that, that Illinois, I think, is sort of seeing some of that, you know, initially when the first projects back in 2016, they were talking about 20 to 40 acres. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, people heard about their neighbors signing up, you know, some of their farm for 20 to 40 acres. And they're like, huh, that's weird. You know, like whatever, whatever floats his boat, right? Um, and then now where you're talking about thousands of acres and there are, there's getting to be, when projects in Illinois for quite a while have been very, very contentious. Solar projects had sort of been spared that. Uh, now with the solar projects getting really big, we're seeing them get a little bit more contentious for a lot of the reasons that Shannon talked about. And, and Howard, have we seen more investor interest come in for some of these land sales that do have, for example, a wind turbine um, on, those, on those acres? I know that drove up a certain land sale in Iowa, but are in general, are you seeing more investor interest come in uh, that is ultimately driving, driving up the price of that land? We have. It, it's been a recent development, but we have seen some folks come to us and say, hey, you know, if you've got a farm that could be a, a candidate for solar development, we would be interested in buying that and taking on that project. So it, it's so new, it isn't a full-blown investment thesis. Uh, but I can also tell you most of these solar developers, uh, not most, but a few of them have gone to the large institutional farmland owners. Uh, and those, those would be representing large pension funds. And they basically said, let us take a look at your portfolio of farms and we'll tell you if they, these pieces qualify for solar or not, or wind or not. And so that kind of work is being done because that would be a much higher rate of return than what the original investment thesis was. And so there, there could be uh, you know, an opportunity for that pension or that institutional asset manager to make a little more uh, spread on that. One thing I did see, Tyne, and back to the concern about young farmers, and it's a valid concern. I've seen in some counties here in Indiana, and I, I watched one at a plan commission hearing that was very contentious. And the project was approved 5 nothing, and it's under construction today. This was uh, 18 months ago that I went to the plan commission hearing when it was approved. In spite of all that animosity, one of the points made was, well, aren't we taking prime farmland out of production? And is that a concern for us? And they were looking at it from a percentage of the total productive acres in the county. And I think you could see maybe state legislation in the future or at least county legislation, because I know the county I live in is debating their solar ordinance right now. And they may put a limit on prime farmland being converted to solar of some percentage. And so that, that is something that I think you're seeing discussions start to happen. And I could see that in the future where there's, oh, maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 3%. You can't put the whole county in solar production, which wouldn't realistically happen anyway. But that, that would be a way to kind of keep it a little more mitigated. Well, and, and how about, oh, okay. go ahead, Shannon, go ahead. No, I was gonna say just real quickly, and I'll make it short. And, and this kind of ties to some questions I'm seeing over in the, in the chat as well. You know, I, I don't know of a lot of US-based projects that have really explored that agrovoltaic space that we talked about. How do we co-locate solar and agricultural production on the same land. It's kind of seen some, some pilot projects in Europe, um, 
But I think that's going to be a big issue because not only are we, are we going to face a lot of increased demands for zero carbon energy in the future, but we got to feed 9 billion people too, which is something we sometimes get about. So you can't really afford to take a lot of bag space. So I think in the next 10 years, you're going to see a lot of push, at least in terms of research and some pilot projects to see how do you actually make ag and solar work together because I don't know we're gonna have a choice long run. I think we have to figure out a way to make that happen. Okay, and, and your point before Howard leads into this next question from David and his question is, how has the agriculture community responded to solar development? His point is, Howard, that he agreed with all the points that you made, but the initial public response has been better solar than wind. However, since in most cases can't row crop under the solar panels, a utility scale solar project will take 500 to 1,000 to multiple thousand acres out of production, you know, and that means losing seed and input sales for that local, you know, that local provider and uh, um, you know, other repercussions. So his main question is, how has the agriculture community responded to solar development? Um, and Howard, I don't know if you want to take this one first. It varies by county. Uh, I have seen counties where they have basically said, yeah, we don't want solar here. And they put in ordinances that will preclude any kind of commercial scale school solar. So 20, 20 acres, fine, but you're not going to have a thousand plus acres. Um, so that, that's where the state of Indiana has actually debated, do we have a statewide solar ordinance requiring setbacks and other things? So I think the, the, there is a lot of sentiment and concern around that subject. Um, I've seen uh, the circle slash through solar farms uh, signs as you drive around various communities, not as much as wind because solar panels are 10 feet tall, not 200. And I think that's a big difference when you start to talk about a solar development versus a wind development is the aesthetics don't change like they do in a wind development. And there is very little noise. I mean, honestly, you get more than 10 feet away from a solar panel, you don't hear it any, uh, above normal audible noise. And uh, it's only 10 feet tall and you can put some natural brakes around it. So it is less obtrusive, I think, um, but uh, it does hurt input sales and those kind of things. At the end of the day, I'm a private property rights advocate. So I'm, I'm gonna advocate for the landowner to be able to do with their property what they want to do. And if they determine that's the best economic for their family, for that property long-term, they ought to have the right to do it. Uh, but they ought to do it with the right, um, I, I don't know, rules in place, parameters in place, that it doesn't hinder what the neighborhood is. And, and those neighbors ought to have an opportunity to, uh, through due course to, to offer their opinions. Um, Lynn Henderson is asking, you know, right now, when you look at, at commodity prices and just on the impressive run that we've seen, is there less interest in leasing cropland to solar wind because of today's high, high commodity prices? So is that another factor uh, that's really impacting decisions right now? And, and Howard, I don't know if you want to take that first and, and, and Garrett wants to chime in there. Well, I, I tell you, Tyne, when I started and the first offer was 4X cropland rents, I, 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 you know, that made all the sense in the world to me why you would do solar. Today, back to Garrett's point, when it started at six to 800, well, six to 800 is maybe just two X what current uh, cash rents would be because of the higher commodity prices on some of these really nice farms uh, that rent for 300, $350 an acre, you know, sometimes you hear 400. So that, I don't think that multiple's enough. And I think that's where Garrett says, now we're seeing numbers and I had on my slide, you know, above $1,000 an acre, that's where the, the solar developers have had to up their game because the, uh, the, the multiple to keep it, uh, the spread, I think the difference that is needed to, to have the landowner uh, take that advantage. And then if you are a large operator and you've got this fixed cost of equipment and labor, uh, and then maybe you grow specialty crops, maybe your revenue per acre is $500 an acre uh, because you're doing tomatoes or you're doing seed production or you're doing something else then that becomes a different equation uh, that the solar developer has to deal with. I'd agree with everything that Howard said. I, I don't think that I've seen necessarily like a, a dramatically reduced interest. Um, I think the prices have gone up. I say right, oh, go rental ahead. prices, 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We have, we have quite a few questions to get through, so we'll make this kind of rapid fire here uh, since we're kind of on, on a timeline, but Hans asks, you know, the average Iowa farmland rental rate 1994 was 9860. Okay. Two and a half rate today would be 24650. For the last decade, the going rental rate has hovered at or above $300 per acre. Would you be happy if you had taken that deal? No, you'd be disappointed in it. Yeah. Shannon, Garrett, anything you guys want to want to add to that? Nothing for me. I just continue to laugh at the rental rates that you guys get up there. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I know Hans is a younger producer, you know, so it's something that really right now we're talking about. Another question, you know, we've asked, can agriculture and green energy, can they coexist? Well, today we're seeing a lot of push for carbon contracts, right? And carbon is, there's a lot of interest in that. So can carbon contracts and green energy, can they coexist? Shannon? I would say I would say that the answer is yes. You got to look very carefully at what your carbon contract says you have to do in terms of carbon sequestration, which especially if we're talking about wind development and also solar development as well, the intensity of that development and how you go about construction, I think is going to be critical to make sure that you don't undo the gains that you might have had with your carbon mitigation uh, strategy. So you've got to read very carefully there. I think it can happen, but it requires very thoughtful construction and, and maintenance projects uh, as well. Garrett? Well, you talk about coexisting. I mean, one of my colleagues is going to be doing a, a number of landowner meetings um, with a group of farmers who are looking at a carbon pipeline being brought across the state to inject CO2 into an area of Illinois that is geologically conducive for that. Um, and so, I mean, I think a lot of it, you know, can it coexist? Well, it's going to, um, you know, like it or not, I think it's going to. Uh, there's, there's that issue of, you know, being paid for carbon friendly um, farming practices. That's one thing, but like I say, we are now seeing um, pipelines injecting lots and lots of CO2, not just not just, oh yeah, cover crops are good and we'll pay you a little bit of money for it, so. Okay, next, oh, go ahead, yeah. Howard. Not in theory, you think it can coexist. Uh, the, the interesting thing that I hear in the carbon market is how do we quantify how much carbon is being sequestered? And so under panels, you're sequestering carbon because you're not tilling that soil. There's a crop growing on it. In theory, it's sucking carbon into the soil. It's really gonna come down to the volume. Now, the other point I'd like to make is I, I am not a, it's risk to me. And if I'm a producer, and like I said earlier, if I have 5,000 acres and I want to put 500 in solar, I still can farm 4,500 time. And I've got 500 acres producing me a solar revenue with no cost. That's low risk. Now, there's risk that solar company doesn't pay you. I get that. But if you feel comfortable with the solar developer and you take that risk of production off the table, Yes, commodity prices are going to come and go. Um, I, I would look at it as a diversifier, and I wouldn't go lock, stock, and barrel into it. That'd be a, a way to look at it if I were if producing 5,000 acres. Okay. Thank you, Howard. All right. John asks, have any of you seen instances where a developer will pay a set amount of legal fees incurred by the landowner in reviewing and negotiating the lease? Shannon, you're shaking your head, so I'll let you go first. <laughs> yeah, in Oklahoma, I've seen developers, and, and say we're in the range between $500 and $750, just offer a flat fee for the landowner to go have their lease reviewed by uh, an attorney, which I think kind of comports with what Garrett was saying, too. Yeah, same thing. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, all right. And I know that this has already been answered kind of on... Um, on the side here, and I'm, I'm going through these questions here, but Jennifer asked, how much of these development decisions should be left to the landowner versus the state limiting land use? Uh, you know, for example, Iowa's proposal to limit solar on ag land. Well, and, and I'll talk about the range of possibilities here because we're working on a, this USDA project that I mentioned earlier, where the, the partner states are New York, Maryland, and Oklahoma. And it is quite spectrum because in Oklahoma, we are completely the wild west there is no state siting authority um, other than our utility commission basically approving the rate case we do not by and large have county zoning and unless you're within a municipality's boundaries there's no municipal zoning so it really is just the private choice of the landowner negotiating with the developer now in other states there might be state level siting authority there may be county zoning that that goes into the entire equation about how you cite those projects and it kind of goes back to, to howard's point um, 
you know, on one hand, you might not want county zoning because you don't want the county telling you how to do stuff on your land, whether it's renewable energy or just you building your barn shop or livestock operation. But um, on the other hand, if you want there to be more concerted and planned land use and you're trying to allocate your best ag land to ag uses versus, you know, more marginal lands to renewable energy, you might want some intervening level. But it's just really it's a function of how your structure looks right now governmentally for a state. Okay, only a few minutes left, uh, but Norman asks, are there any projects that are co-location for solar with panels and cropping um, that you have seen? And I know we've, we've talked about that some here, uh, but just want to make sure we, we we cover on that too for some of those producers on here. I'll say and this. I just, I'll, go ahead. Oh, I have not heard of any in, in Illinois. Um, it's talked about, but I have not seen any leases that would allow for such a thing. You know, and we've talked about you know, using corners for um, for wind development, I think that's a tremendous opportunity for for solar as well, which we just haven't seen yet. But I I would be strongly surprised if we didn't see it soon. Um, Jeremy asked. Oh, go I'm ahead. Go ahead, Howard. Yeah, I'm not aware of any either in the eastern corner. Belt. Okay. Jeremy asks, what happens if a large source of cheap energy enters the market? How does this short and long term affect the market as well as the strategy? You know, I, I've seen, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Shannon. Oh, well, I would, I would just say, you know, I, I get that question a lot. And the thing is, unless somebody in a lab tomorrow just cracks room temperature fusion, um, which has been the power of the future for the last 50 years and appears to be uh, destined to stay that way for a while, there's, there's really not a technology out there um, that really changes this. Nuclear is probably the best option for that. But again, if I showed you the cost, nuclear it's it's staggeringly higher than all the other technologies are on the board right now so for the projects that we're talking about in the horizon of 20 to 30 years i i just don't see a technology out there that really stands to unseat this but what i do see and this goes back to the point that i made in the presentation with that reduction in costs in battery storage that makes renewable power dispatchable and that is just an absolute game changer in the utility price market and I think if you get you, those batteries down to that $100 mark, you're going to see tremendous pressure for both wind and solar development. I think this is going to take off like a rocket ship, honestly. Okay, we only have about one minute left, so I'm sorry to dive in here before I need to hand it back over. But Howard, I'll start with you. What is the one thing that you want to leave us with today as we look at this topic? Well, I just think it's important for landowners to think, consider the opportunity. Don't just rule it out because I always want a farm. Look at it as an opportunity to diversify your income stream, diversify your operation, and maybe protect the farm for many, many generations to come. Do it right, work with an attorney, put the protections in, and, and you'll love it. Great. Garrett? Uh, these agreements, listen, if I'm a lawyer and, I'm, and my client is a solar developer or a wind developer, I write that contract near as I can in every instance in favor of my client, the landowner or the solar developer. Uh, anyone who's going to be interested in this has to get their own attorney who is going to sort of try to negotiate some of that to make it more fair. Talk to a lawyer who has experience with dealing with these. Hey, and Shannon, to wrap us up, what do you want to leave us with? Get good objective sources of information to guide you through this process. Get a lawyer and get everything in writing. All right. Thank you so much. I mean, we've talked about so much here today. Hopefully we answered most of those questions, but we did record this. So I know there's a lot of details in here that if you want to, you know, go through that again, there will be a recording of this available so that you can do that. So thank you again to all of our panelists. Um, a lot to think about when we talk about green energy pitfalls and payouts on the farm. So thank you so much uh, to everyone for that. And I think I want to hand it back over uh, to the foundation here for today. Um, and I think there's some, some closing comments. Sherry? Great time. Thank you so much for facilitating that great conversation. And thank you, Shannon, Howard, and Garrett for sharing all of your insights. And to our audience for all the great questions. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback, so please make sure you take a moment to share your comments about the session in the brief survey that you'll see at the conclusion of the forum.
And if you'd like to help us continue to provide valuable programming such as today's forum, I'll just quickly remind you about becoming a friend of Farm Foundation too. Check the link provided in the chat or you can always go to our website to find out more about that program. Each and every gift to Farm Foundation strengthens our ability to address rapidly evolving issues impacting agriculture, the food system and rural communities. And we're so grateful for your support. So thank you once again for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thanks everyone.